surnames, Christian names, as we have seen, being given in baptism, the increasing population and the development of transit, and other matters of social progress, demonstrated the insufficiency of the Christian name alone. One would have expected the development to have been upon the lines of a second baptismal name. As a matter of fact, the idea of a second baptismal name does not become at all a usual practice until the latter half of the 18th century, though isolated cases are met with earlier. The development, like so many other matters in our constitution, was an accident, though an inevitable one, and entirely unpremeditated. Here it may be interesting to note that the definition of the word surname is from, according to some authorities, the French sua, Latin super, meaning over and above. That is, the surname is over and above the name. Probably the phonetic corruption of the word surname to surname was the origin of the word sci name, which is now identical in meaning with surname, but sci name is not the derivation of the word surname, plausible as such a supposition may appear. Ducange, on the other hand, suggests that surnames were first written, not in a direct line after the Christian name, but above it, and hence they were called in Latin supranomina, in Italian supranomi and in French surnoms. Originally, any name other than the Christian name was a surname. It should be borne in mind that anciently a man had but one Christian name. With regard to the origin of surnames, it may here be pointed out that surnames of the nature of nicknames can be traced back to mythological times, but they were transient, and as often as not conferred after death. In England nothing of the nature of a hereditary surname existed before the conquest. True. A man was occasionally described as the son of his father, for example, the names Godwinson and Leah Freakson are well known, though contemporary proof of the usage of such names is not easy to find. But these were not hereditary, and being literally used, must have been altered of necessity with each generation. With the Norman conquest many things, many laws and many customs, changed completely. It is to the Norman invasion that we owe surnames. In considering the origin of surnames it must be remembered that to all intents and purposes in those days there were but two classes patricians and plebans. The latter were chiefly of a status little, if anything, better than slavery. In fact the serfs were slaves, though there was also a small, but a decidedly small class who were the merchants and traders the freemen and burgesses of the towns. The patricians were the lawmakers. They made the laws to suit their own ways and ideas, to safeguard their own interests, and though it is now the case that the provisions of Magna Carta are the inherent birthright of every Englishman, it should be borne in mind that there was a large class then in existence who would have found it hard indeed to claim the rights extorted by the barons from the king, theoretically for the benefit of all men, really for the benefit of themselves alone. But even as far as the barons were concerned, Magna Carta was merely a declaration of rights supposedly then existing, and, as a document, a treaty between the barons and the king that these rights of theirs should be observed. The barons were looking after their own interests, and the patrician of those days would see and admit but little social difference between his churls and the traders of a town. There were but few traders in those days that rose much beyond the level of the peddler of today. The point it is desirable to emphasize is the wide distinction between the landholders who were the upper class and the remainder. The upper class were few in number, there was land enough for all. In those days it needed no great quantity of land to sustain a gentleman. Therefore, to all intents and purposes, every gentleman was a landholder, the overlords held direct from the crown, rendering in return the military service which, according to their holdings, could be demanded from them. They sublet their lands, and the under-tenants were liable to them for military and other services. The whole being and existence of the Norman upper class was inseparably bound up in and interwoven with the land and the feudal tenure of it. The Saxon landholders who would not accept the new order of things simply went under. In those days human life was cheap, both in theory and in fact. One when a man's Christian name was not a sufficiently distinctive description, it followed, of course, that he was described as of his lands that is, to such and such a place. Now that practice, which is unquestionably Norman, dates back in this country as an assured and settled custom at least as far as the conquest. But the Normans, who brought with them the practice of describing themselves as of order their lands, also unquestionably, as is still so often the case with colonists, 
in many cases transplanted the Norman place names to their new estates, and so perpetuated for themselves in England the same designation which they had previously enjoyed in Normandy. Others retained their Norman estates and designations, but these designations were not Zur names, as is amply evidenced by the fact, provable in a few cases but suspected in many, that on different occasions the same man figures in different localities under different designations. But it should be remembered that at first such additions were not names they were merely descriptions and they were not hereditary. If a man changed his lands he changed his description, which now we should call his name, with his lands. As a matter of course, if a man divided his estate amongst his sons, each son had a different description which he took from the particular lands he held. A man might give his lands away, he might sell them, he might settle them, he could not dispose of them by will until at a much later date. In those days there was no estate duty to avoid. The Plantagenets had not yet begotten that scion of their race who initiated that impost. Therefore, unless circumstances compelled a man to part with his property, he usually held tight to his lands until he died, and at his death his heir succeeded. As a rule, therefore, a man was succeeded by his son, and he, in his turn, by his son. As son, grandson and great-grandson, each in his turn succeeded, he, as a matter of course, also succeeded, along with the lands, to the same description as being of order those same particular lands. This particular description recurring unaltered generation after generation, the form became stereotyped, colloquially the dough would be dropped, and the same description being universally applied to the same family, it came to be regarded as a constituent part of a man's name. Younger sons who were not provided with lands of their own did one of two things, they married an heiress, and then became described as of her lands, they did not take her surname, for surname she had none, or else they stayed in the old homestead in readiness to render the military service for which the landholder was liable to the king. As they remained at the old home, possibly with some interest actual and reversionary or maybe no more than an intangible moral right to sustenance, as children of their father, from their father's lands, it was only natural that they also were described and referred to as of the place even when they personal ally had no actual possession therein. And it is difficult in fact, practically impossible to say when such a description came to be a name, and ceased to be a description. The point is of some importance, because many of these early changes apparently changes of name, but in reality nothing more than mere changes of description are glibly quoted as precedents to show that no authorization was or is needed to make a change. As a matter of fact, they are not changes of name at all and though perfectly authentic pedigrees can be produced showing the same addition, in place of a surname, to the Christian name generation after generation back to the conquest, such additions were most certainly not fixed or necessarily hereditary, nor were they surnames until a much later date. But it was the regular recurrence of the same territorial description from father to son that stereotyped that description into a name, and which, by a very natural evolution, caused surnames to be considered to be and to become hereditary. Concurrently with the evolution of surnames from territorial designations, the same process was going on in relation to offices. Some were actually and by law hereditary, and other posts, whilst not having a compulsorily hereditary attribute, were nevertheless held by successive generations of the same family. It is worth the passing remark in such cases where the successive holders of an office consequently enjoying therefrom the same description, have not sometimes been too readily assumed to be a succession of father and son, and accepted as names in a pedigree. The same sequence must naturally have occurred in regard to mere trade or occupation, the succession of a son to his father's trade, a circumstance which even now occurs constantly. Again, a large number of surnames are of patronymic origin, the prefixes of ap or fitz or mac or o, and the affix of son being a regular customary use. Names of this character at their inception were presumably names only of a generation. But sons are baptized in their father's names, and it would need but two or three generations in which the same patronymic was consequently continued to stereotype it into a surname. The hereditary repetition of a personal peculiarity would also stereotype a nickname, which unquestionably some of the Norman designations were. All these circumstances acting concurrently in England produced our hereditary surnames, 
which in the upper classes date from about the 12th century. In Wales, Scotland and Ireland, where the Norman influence scarcely penetrated, the causes and effects were different. Of course there are a few, a very few, exceptions, but to all intents and purposes it may be taken to be an established fact that the ancient families in England are those which have territorial surnames. What, then, becomes of the role of Battle Abbey? To begin with, the role of Battle Abbey no longer exists, no one knows whether it ever had any actual existence, and nobody really knows what names were originally upon it. So called copies of it exist, but they all differ widely, and it is known to have been extensively tampered with. The names upon it are chiefly territorial descriptions, Christian names, patronymic descriptions and nicknames. None of these had then any fixed hereditary character. But as the earliest copy known is centuries later in its date, the appearance of a particular name is no evidence that that name existed at the conquest. A few of the patronymics have remained due no doubt to the inherent inducements to christen a child after his father or grandfather. A few of the nicknames survived long enough to become crystallized into names, for the natural tendency of a nickname is to stick. Personal characteristics, admirable or the contrary, were then the source of all nicknames, and personal characteristics were hereditary long before surnames became so. The nicknames were perpetuated by virtue of their being perennially appropriate and by their being reconferred in the succeeding generations in which the personal characteristics were reproduced. But even in cases where the same nickname is repeated in later dates, there is seldom documentary evidence to show blood relationship between any two holders. In all times people have been only too ready to assume that a similarity of name indicated descent or relationship. But the point is simply this. It is no good boasting of a Norman pedigree unless you have at least a territorial or a distinctly Norman name. Patronymic names for example, Robinson, Jackson and Johnson and names deriving from occupations for example, Smith, Cook, Fletcher did not originate till much later, and never originated at all in England amongst the upper classes. The upper classes in nearly every case took their names from their territorial descriptions. Those outside the landholding classes had no need for surnames till a later date. They were never mentioned in a legal deed, and their Christian names, and perhaps a nickname, answered all distinctive purposes amongst the few friends and neighbors who comprised the small circle of their acquaintance. They lived and died and were forgotten. A moment's thought will show that this was so. Even at the present day there are hundreds of the lower classes who are only known by a Christian name and a nickname, and who find that the only occasions on which they have the slightest use or opportunity of using a surname are their registration of birth, occasionally for the purpose of a marriage at their appearances in the police courts, and for the inquests at their deaths. There is scarcely a week goes past that the press does not provide some instance or other of the difficulty such people and their friends find in coming to a decision as to what their surnames may really be. Whether the education department will be able to alter matters in the near future still remains to be seen, but if in this busy, overpopulated 20th century there are still people who, without inconvenience, can dispense with the attribute of a hereditary surname and it is evident that there are it is not to be wondered at that in early times the possession of a hereditary name was not amongst the lower classes a long felt want. At any rate, those who were not patricians and not landholders managed to rub along without stationary or properly hereditary surnames until the 12th or the beginning of the 13th century. From about that period, or perhaps a little later, Surnames became hereditary and fairly universal in all classes in England. But the upper classes had already obtained their names from their lands. The rest had no lands to take names from. Therefore we find they obtained their names from other sources. It should not be forgotten that no man chose his own name. It was unconsciously conferred by his neighbors who applied to him the most readily recognized description that would particularize him as and when the necessity arose that he should be particularized. There are many names which no sane man is ever likely to have deliberately selected for himself. His name was a matter of common repute the description by which his neighbors happened to refer to him and was neither assumed nor conferred by any overt or specific act. There was to all intents and purposes no general legislation concerning names, simply because the patricians needed none for themselves, the description of their lands answering every purpose. The doings of plebans, which did not affect the comfort or prosperity of their lords, were not worth consideration, 
and certainly did not merit legislation. The laws of those days were not dictated by Newcastle or other programs. Each particular enactment which happened to be made law was due to a palpable necessity of the moment. Surnames other than territorial descriptions were, we must remember, the simple result of necessity, when population, therefore isolated and small, became so increased as to necessitate further particularity than the merely personal one could supply. Bardsley in his English surnames places the date of the general assumption of surnames too early, but his remarks are worth quoting. In the 11th and 12th centuries, however, a change took place. By a silent and unpremeditated movement over the whole of the more populated and civilized European societies, nomenclature began to assume a solid, lasting basis. It was the result, in fact, of an insensibly growing necessity. Population was on the increase, commerce was spreading, and with all this arose difficulties of individualization. It was impossible, without some further distinction, to maintain a current identity. Hence what had been but an occasional and irregular custom became a fixed and general practice the distinguishing sobriquet, not of premeditation, but by a silent understanding came at length to be fixed and hereditary. This sobriquet had come to be of various kinds. It might be the designation of property owned. Or it might be some local peculiarity that marked the abode. It might be the designation of the craft the owner followed. It might be the title of the rank or office he held. It might be a patronymic a name acquired from the personal or Christian name of his father or mother. It might be some characteristic, mental or physical, complementary or the reverse, any of these it might be, it mattered not which, but when once it became attached to the possessor and gave him a fixed identity, it clung to him for his life, and eventually passed on to his offspring. Bardsley, in his well-known book on the origin of English surnames, divides them into five classes, i, baptismal or personal names, better described, perhaps, as patronymic names, two, local zoo names, three, official surnames, 4, occupative surnames, 5, sobriquet surnames or nicknames of the first class, Williams, Thompson, Wilcox and Fitzgibbon are good examples. In the second, distinction ought to be drawn between territorial and local names. Of the former kind are the place names anciently written with de before them, signifying the former lordships of the lands, of the latter are the names which merely arose from residence, for example, by water, lane, field, styles, ashurst, atwood, amongst surnames of office are Hayward, Buckmaster, Hunter, Falconer. In the fifth class the following must be placed, Thakar, Mason, Slater, Viner. The last class is very numerous, for example, Little, Black, Fairfax, Fox, Wagstaff, Wise, Benbow. Hard man. Mr. Bardsley once went to the trouble of analyzing the names in the first five letters of the alphabet in the London Directory. Here are his figures, territorial and local. 11,360 baptismal, 8,203 occupative. 2,651 official, 1,737 nicknames. 3,096 foreign. 1584 doubtful, 1694 30325. In referring to local and territorial names, particularly the latter, it is well to raise the warning that the possession of a territorial name does not necessarily even suggest dissent from the lords of those lands. A large proportion of foundlings have been given surnames from the names of the places on which they were found. Further, Former residents in a different place often conferred the name of that place as a surname, when in another locality it was necessary to distinguish a stranger who had come there from. We have now seen how and when surnames originated in England. Let us next turn to Wales. In no country in the world is the origin of each name so universally one and the same as in the Principality. Roughly speaking, there is but one class of surnames in Wales the patronymic class. There are one or two rare exceptions but they are so rare that they can be quite dismissed from consideration, but saving these, there are no territorial names at all in Wales. For all practical purposes it can be taken to be an established and indisputable point that every properly Welsh surname is patronymic in its origin, 
that is, it is derived from the Christian name of the father. From the circumstance of their common British origin, it might be supposed that the Welsh people and the inhabitants of Cornwall would exhibit some analogous principles in the construction of their Zur names. Such, however, is not the case. The Cornish surnames are mostly local, derived from words of British root, and they are often strikingly peculiar. A large number have the prefix tr, a town, and the words bol, a pool, ben, a head, ros, a heath, and lan, a church, are also of frequent occurrence, and the Cornish rhyme. By tr, pol and pen, you shall know the Cornish men, has obtained for itself a worldwide acceptance. This is a striking proof that in the very earliest times there were no such things as surnames at all much less hereditary surnames. Hereditary surnames were not in use in any form, even amongst the gentry and landholders in Wales, until the time of Henry VIII, nor were they generally established until a much later period. Indeed, at the present day they can scarcely be said to be adopted amongst the lower classes in the wilder districts, where, as the marriage registers show, the Christian name of the father still frequently becomes the patronymic of the son. The way in which a Welshman was in a former day described was by his own Christian name, followed by the word Ap, meaning the son of, and his father's Christian name, as Hugh Ap Howell. The Welsh Ap is the exact equivalent of the Norman Fitz, and the Scottish Mac, and the Irish O, and something akin to the Maltese of the present day. But with regard to the Norman Fitz and perhaps the remark should more properly have been inserted when dealing with Norman names the use of the prefix always carries with it a kind of lingering suggestion of bastardy, though this is far from being always the case. A Norman in the ordinary event inherited his father's lands and territorial description. A bastard inherited neither lands nor name and therefore the Fitz was added to his father's Christian name when the father would acknowledge the relationship. We shall have occasion later to refer to the cases and rights of illegitimate children, but the point is illustrated by an ancient ballad. When Henry I. wished to marry his son Robert to Mabel, co-heiress of Fitzherman, the lady demurred, apostrophe it was to me a great shame to have a lord with Houghton his twin name, Robert of Gloucester. Whereupon, says Camden, the king, his father, gave him the name of Fitzroy, so that the aristocratic Fitz is somewhat discounted in value. Still, in these days when a pedigree of any sort beyond one's great-grandfather is something to talk about, a bastardy in Norman days is a somewhat remote contingency. A Welsh gentleman was not content with merely announcing the name of his father. Everybody could do that much. So he added his grandfather and his great-grandfather and even a hundred years ago it was not unusual to hear Welsh names such as Evnap Griffith Ap David Ap Jenkin, and so on up to the seventh and eighth generation. The church at Langolan remains solemnly, we give this on the authority of an article in the Cornhill magazine for July 1862, for it needs somebody to take the responsibility for the assertion from one's own shoulders, dedicated to St. Gillen Ap Gwyn or Gap Clind or Gap Cowdo Ap Caradoc. Fridge for Zeppelin Miriam Apernion Thap Cunedo Ledic. Bearing this practice in mind, one pauses aghast at the frightful efforts of memory which Welsh nomenclature, both local and personal, must have necessitated. Evidently, the names the Welsh had occasion to use had the advantage of keeping their memories in good practice. To burlesque this extraordinary fashion of nomenclature, a witty rhymester of the 17th century describes Welsh cheese as Adam's own cousin German by its birth. Ap curds ap milk ap cow ap grass ap earth. The string of Christian names that formerly answered all distinctive purposes with the Welsh reminds one of the story, though there is no real connection between the two, of the purveyor of groceries, who in his year of office as mayor was elevated to the bench of the great unpaid. The sergeant of police, in mentioning a prisoner who needed the mayor's attention, referred to him as Thomas Smith, alias Jones, alias the Snatcher. Ah, said his worship. Suppose we take the ladies first bring up Alice Jones. In the plays of the Elizabethan period there is frequent allusion to this ludicrous Welsh system of names. But it distinctly had its advantages, for it preserved identity and descent and relationship in a manner utterly unknown in England. Thirty to thirty-three or thirty-four generations are the outside limit possible of any English or Norman pedigree save the royal ones. It is otherwise in Wales and there is one well-known instance Lloyd of Stockton, Company, Salop in which the pedigree in the male line, 
without a single break, can be shown for 66 generations, though it goes back almost to the times of legend, there seems to be no reason whatever to doubt it as a Welsh pedigree, for the early part is that of ruling princes in Wales, in whose retinue are bards and minstrels, who kept the descent alive in song and story as a part of their regular duties. But if any book of Welsh pedigrees be examined, it will be at once apparent that the whole of the landed and upper classes had these patronymic names. In the upper classes in Wales surnames were adopted universally at about the same period the reign of Henry VIII. One writer says, he strongly recommended the heads of Welsh families to conform to the English usage, and, in consequence, many houses made their old names stationary. Other writers have assigned the change to the introduction and necessities due to the establishment of the system of parish registers, in fact, this is held by many to be largely the true cause which rendered surnames stationary and hereditary throughout England as well, where they had hitherto been somewhat loosely applied. Other writers refer to a statute of King Henry VIII, definitely enacting that the Welsh should conform to the English practice. We confess, however, that up to the present we have failed to discover the statute, if any such exists. We are inclined to think that the reason is rather more due to the fact that the accession of the House of Tudor to the English throne brought the Welsh and English gentry into closer intimacy. The undoubted tendency of the English of those days to sneer at the rude uncouthness of the Welsh caused the latter who considered themselves to be as well or better born than the English to adopt the English ways and English customs which were current in the English court, in order to remove the reasons of the supercilious sneers they encountered. Any social practice originating with the highest classes quickly permeates down through the ranks of those who copy their betters. By the reign of Henry VIII. The originally territorial nature of English aristocratic surnames had been in a way lost sight of. Therefore the Welsh, in copying the English in the adoption of surnames, or else in the process of evolution from their own practices, simply made permanent and stationary for their surnames whatever Christian names their fathers had, which Christian names, with the addition of Ap, had already been added to their own. Ap Hugh became Pew, Ap Howell became Powell, a priest became Price. The other alternative adopted would seem to show an English model. Evan's son became Evans, John's son became Jones, William's son became Williams, and in one or other of these two forms of procedure all Welsh surnames originated. Before leaving the subject of Welsh names, one cannot help remarking the large number of the natives of Wales who deliberately duplicate their surnames in the Christian names chosen for their sons. There must be a legion who at the present day are labelled Hugh Hughes, John Jones, Owen Owen, William Williams, or Hugh Pugh. One might, perhaps, attribute it to the unconscious poetic or musical instinct which exists in most inhabitants of hill countries, and to whom the alliteration might be an unwritten attraction. That however, is merely a suggestion, and not a statement of provable or admitted fact. If territorial names are absent in Wales, they are vastly to the fore in Scotland. In spite of all one hears of land hunger in Ireland, there is no quarter of the globe where the land and the lordship thereof claim and obtain so great a respect or exercise such a fascination as in Scotland. Even in this hard-headed commercial age, the patriarchal veneration for the laird of the parish is still a factor to be counted. At the present day in England, scarcely an individual we know of no single one is habitually spoken of by the bare description of his lands, without any prefix of his name. In Scotland the smallest freeholder is still as often referred to by the designation of his estates as by his Christian or his surname. In England we have Langton of Langton, Craster of Craster, Corbet of Morton Corbet, Acton of Acton, Aldersey of Aldersey, Clifton of Clifton, Eaton of Eaton, Estcourt of Estcourt, Lother of Lother, Gattaca of Gattaca, and many others, but it would be considered an impertinence to drop the names or titular prefix. In Scotland it is otherwise, and not only do their neighbours merely use the designation of their lands in referring to them, but so fixed and accepted is the custom that the larger landholders, who by long inheritance have, as it were, acquired a hereditary right to such descriptions, themselves use them. For instance, Mr. Ewan Macpherson of Clooney Castle, who is always spoken of in Scotland as Clooney Macpherson, and that without a Mr., 
in writing a letter in the third person refers to himself as Clooney. In the same way Mr. Cameron of Lochiel is always spoken of and calls himself Lochiel. Apropos of this, it may be recalled that the late Sir Frank Lockwood, at a reception, hearing the butler announce Lochiel and Lady Margaret Cameron, announced himself in his turn to that functionary as 24 Prince's Gardens and Lady Lockwood. In the same way there is another Scottish practice which is unfamiliar to English ears. When the surname and the designation of the lands are the same, a Scotsman describes himself as of that ilk, that is, of that same, name, for example, Eleven Udney of that ilk, MacLeod of that ilk, Lamond of that ilk, Macintosh of that ilk, though the latter is more generally known as the Macintosh. That, again, is a custom the English never aspire to, some even object to it to wit, the cabby to whom the Macintosh paid a level shilling for an eighteen penny fare. The usual abuse followed, and then, my fare's eighteen pence, and I want another sixpence, mun. Do you know Ken who you're talking to? What do I care who you are, mun? I'm the Macintosh of Macintosh. And do you think I care whether you're the blessed old umbrella as well? Hand out that Dana. It needed the ignorance of the Southron to fail to appreciate the revelation. With and akin to, or perhaps arising from, this patriarchal veneration of the laird and the land, there has grown up in Scotland the clan feeling. The clan feeling is strong and intense in Scotland now and he is a proud man who is chief of a clan. He has hundreds in his train to do him homage, for which he makes no return and bears no responsibilities other than those he chooses to adopt. Of course, there are many chiefs of clans who are admitted and recognized by everybody, but, like every other honor, it has produced a crowd of spurious pretenders. To our own knowledge, there are some half dozen who claim to be chief of clan Chatan. Outside the territorial names, which are far greater numerically in proportion to the population in Scotland than elsewhere in the United Kingdom, by far the greater proportion of Scottish names are distinctly due to this clan spirit. The Scottisan was a born fighter. Occasionally in his spare moments he might be induced to turn his attention to the land, but he much preferred looting his neighbour's cattle to rearing his own. Now, man is gregarious, and the duel was of later growth and the inevitable result was that the looting was not done single-handed. It was not theft, it was the fortune of war, and the clans, which were originally gangs of cattle lifters, developed into tribes, perpetually warring with each other. Of course, a man's kinsfolk backed him in his quarrels, and undoubtedly kinship was the initial bond which held the clan together, but as the clans increased in size and importance, the embrace of the clan was widened, and every gentleman brought his servants, his tenants and his followers into the clan to fight with him, and to fight the battles of the clan. Recruits even were sometimes raised in England. Now, these servants and followers all either assumed the name of the chief of the clan or the name of the divisional head under whose particular leadership they were. That is the source from which the majority of the Scots assumed their names. Could anyone suppose for one moment that every one of the name of Campbell had blood descent from the house of Lome? But if we trace the matter a step further back, and deal with the derivation of the clan names in Scotland. The Registrar General for that country in his sixth report remarks, almost all the names of our border and highland clans belong to the first class, surnames derived from patronymics, and they are peculiarly Scottish, neither belonging to England nor to Ireland. These surnames include all those beginning with Mac, as MacGregor, MacTaggart, and C, besides those simple ones, as Fraser, Douglas, Cameron, Carr, Grant, and C. Dot. Surnames taken from the locality in which the persons originally resided form a very numerous class. Dot, and there is scarcely a county, parish, town, river or remarkable locality but has its name perpetuated in the surnames. But, taking them all in all, and as compared with other countries, in Scotland there is a comparatively short list of surnames, partly from the use of clan designations, and partly from the same cause as in Wales, the secluded and rude condition of the people, which is still especially the case along the coast and in the fishing villages. When the fashion of distinctive Zur names was first carried into the north, about the time of the Reformation, the inhabitants of these secluded places seem to have felt the lack of characteristic designation severely, the fishing intellect being naturally limited. According to the clever writer of an article in Blackwood, S. Magazine for April 1842, on Fisher Folk, 
There were then seldom more than two or three surnames in a town. In booking their customers, the grocers invariably inserted the nickname, or teen name, and in case of married men they wrote down the wife's along with the husband's name. Unmarried customers had the names of their parents inserted with their own. The following anecdote is given by the same writer. In one of the Buchan fishing villages a stranger had occasion to call on a fisherman of the name of Alexander White. Meeting a girl, he asked, could you tell me fas any fight lives? Fix any fight? Muckles any fight? Fick muckles any fight? Muckle langs any fight? Fick muckle langs any fight? Muckle lang glides any fight? Shouted the stranger. Oh, it's scoop the lift ye are seeking, cried the girl and fat that Vulford in a ye spear for the man by his rick name at Anne's. We are ourselves ignorant of the Scottish language, and had our doubts as to the strict propriety of the foregoing, but we print it, relying upon the known respectability of the magazine we quote. There are reasons to suppose that, although 1842 is now an ancient date for these kingdoms, the peculiarity to which we point still exists in Scotland. A list of all the parishioners of a parish on Donside who voted in the election of a parish clerk in 1524 is preserved. The minister found all their names, with the exception of one or two existing in the parish in 1860. The only laws, save those acts relating to specific cases and legalizing specific changes, relating to Scottish surnames of which we are aware are the Lion Office Act of 1672, to which we have already referred, and the acts relating to the name McGregor. By an act of the Scottish Privy Council, dated April 3, 1603, the name of Gregor, or McGregor, was expressly abolished, and those who had hitherto borne it were commanded to change it for other surnames, the pain of death being denounced against those who should call themselves Gregor or McGregor, the names of their fathers. By a subsequent act of council, June 24, 1613, death was denounced against any person of the clan called McGregor. Again, by an act of parliament, 1617, chap. 26. These laws were continued and extended to the rising generation, inasmuch as great numbers of the children of those against whom the acts of the Privy Council had been directed were stated to be then approaching to maturity, who, if are permitted to resume the name of their parents, would render the clan as strong as it was before. But upon the restoration King Charles, in the first Scottish Parliament of his reign, Statute 1661, Chap. 195, annulled the various acts against the clan MacGregor, and restored them to the full use of their name. In considering the derivation of Irish surnames, the history of the country must be carefully borne in mind. There have been settlements of English and settlements of Scots in the sister kingdom, which have added a large number of names of distinctly English and Scottish origin to those which were originally to be found in Ireland. The present population of Ireland, though a mixture of a number of different races, is a mixture however, in which the Celtic is the predominant element. The great bulk of the most common names in the country are undoubtedly of Celtic origin. Many of them still retain the prefixes O and Mac, the former of which is peculiar to Ireland, whilst the latter belongs to both Ireland and Scotland. In many cases, however, these prefixes have been dropped, and it is a matter of common occurrence to find in the same record the same Celtic names written with and without these said prefixes. The coeval existence of two languages in the country accounts for the practice, which still prevails in some parts of Ireland, of using interchangeably English names, together with their Irish translations or equivalents. In some cases it is now impossible to trace whether families are of Celtic or English descent inasmuch as some of the English settlers took Irish names, and Irish families were compelled to take English surnames. The sources from which Irish names have been derived are the same as in England and Scotland, but the tribal spirit was pronounced in Ireland, as it was in Scotland, and consequently the truly Irish names are limited in number. In the matter of special legislation concerning surnames, Ireland has been more highly favoured than any other nation. It was provided by a statute of as long ago as 1366 that, every Englishman do use the English language, and be named by an English name, leaving off entirely the manner of naming used by the Irish. This is a ball worthy of the sister isle, but again, in 1465, in the fourth year of the reign of Edward IV, an act was passed, 
at the request of the Commons, it is ordained and established by authority of the said Parliament, holden at Trim in 1465, that every Irishman that dwells betwixt or amongst Englishmen in the county of Dublin, Myeth, Ural and Kildare, shall go like to an Englishman in apparel, and shaving off his beard above the mouth, and shall take to him an English surname of one town, as Sutton, Chester, Trime, Scrine, Cork, Kinsale, or Colour, as White, Black, Brown, or Art or Science, as Smith or Carpenter, or Office, as Cook, Butler, and that he and his issue shall use his name, under pain of forfeiting of his goods yearly till the premises be done, Statutes at Large in Ireland, 1786, Volume I. p. 29. In the eleventh year of Queen Elizabeth an act was passed that five persons of the best and eldest of every nation amongst the Irish should bring in all the idle persons of their surname to be justified by law, and in the same year an act was passed for the attainder of Shane O'Neill and for the extinction of the name of O'Neill. The most recent attempt at legislation was not, however, successful, and the bill introduced by Mr. McAleese, MP, to enable any Irishman to prefix Owen Mac to his surname, was not passed. Such being the origin of surnames, we now come to their legal aspect. A surname is no more than a description for purposes of identification. By long continued and universal custom surnames are hereditary, and that custom the law would unquestionably recognize, failing in a specific case specific facts to the contrary. Custom regards it as a fixed hereditary right that a son should inherit his surname from his father, and inasmuch as a name ordinarily must be inherited, it is presumably a hereditament, and that being so, an incorporeal one. But surely there is no other so intangible, for, speaking broadly, the law provides no specific method for the creation of names. Nor is the hereditament of a name one in which any right of property exists that can be enforced. A surname cannot be given, sold or bequeathed, for no one person can create a right in a surname, nor convey any right in a surname to another. The basis of this peculiar state of affairs is simply that a man cannot give himself a surname. His surname is whatever name he is universally known by and his right to that or any surname is in ordinary circumstances due solely and entirely to the general custom observed by others, who call him and know him by that surname, and the general, in fact universal, custom is that a man's surname is the same as that of his father, that a woman's name, until marriage, is that of her father, and after marriage that of her husband, and the general custom does not regard surnames as changeable of mere motion but regards them as fixed and unalterable. Now, no man can create a custom at or of his pleasure. The creation of a custom needs general and universal consent and assent. The law, where custom is not in conflict with the common law, upon proof made of that custom, must accept that custom is law and is binding, and must recognize and administer that custom, and it is amazing that this principle of our law should have been so frequently overlooked in regard to the interpretation of law in cases in which a name has been a material issue, for the custom of inheritance of a name from the father is so undoubted, and its acceptance so universal, that it must be accepted as part of our common law. Every man has a right to require the use of his right name, and in any legal document may require that such name, and that name only, shall appear and be used as his name. For ordinarily every man has a genuine name, that is, his baptismal name or names, followed by the surname of his father. But no man can insist that another shall address him or describe him by a name other than his baptismal and paternal names, unless he have authority for the new name, because, failing such express authority, the basis of the new name is but custom, and that custom must be universal before it is binding, and in the face of the refusal to concede the name, how can a universal custom be pleaded? A false name certainly does not invalidate marriage, though this has often been supposed. It is the two people who go through the ceremony who are married, and their names have nothing whatever to do with the fact of the ceremony, and consequently the names have no relation to the validity of the marriage. To this proposition, however, there is one seeming but not actual exception. If either party to a marriage, by the use of a false name, willfully deceives the other party so that the identity is obscured to the extent that the said other party believes he or she is making a totally different marriage. The marriage is void, but it is void as a contract based upon fraud, 
and the false name is there merely means or evidence of fraud, and not in itself the essential fraud. Providing there be nothing in the nature of fraud, there is nothing in our criminal law to prevent the use of any name, and no injunction for a discontinuance will lie, do boule case. Nor at the moment of writing is there anything to prevent the use and assumption or wrongful retention of any title or dignity, Cowley case, 85 liters. T. Rep. 254, p. 1900, 118, AC 1901, 450. It is possible, however, that the committee sitting to inquire into certain matters connected with the barantage may recommend certain procedure to that end. But in matters of trade a man may not use even his own genuine name in such a way as to lead the public to be under the impression that they are dealing with some other firm, Valentine v. Valentine, 31 liters. R. Ear. 488, Holloway v. Holloway, 13 Beef. 209.